Hello chess fans, this is Rick from Chess to Impress with a video on fire on board in Kramnik against Shirov. It's also number 9 in the series The Rook Rules. It's a series in which a specific piece plays an important role, King, Queen, Rook, Bishop, Knight and Pawn and this as said is number 9 in The Rook Rules. You can find the earlier videos in the playlist of this piece rules series. The link is in the description box of this video. We're going to look at a game played in 1994 in Linares in the south of Spain, which in those days was the Wimbledon of chess. White was Vladimir Kramnik, six years before he would become world champion by beating Garry Kasparov, and black was Alexei Shirov, and I got a title from his book. Fire on Board is the title of a book he wrote, and that's one of the best chess books ever written. Let's see what happened in this game. Kramnik was white and opened with a knight. d5, d4 and bishop f5. Theoretically dubious, but Shirov plays it at the highest level. And that's one of the reasons that he's so popular. Kramnik goes for the main line. c4, e6. Black has solved this problem from the light squared bishop, which is a problem in the queen's gambit declined. But will that bishop now not be missed on the queen side? Let's have a look what happened. Knight c3, c6, queen b3, putting his finger on the sore spot on b7. The bishop is no longer on c8, protecting that pawn. Queen b6, solving that problem. But after c5, the queen gets kicked. Queen takes b3 is possible, but then white gets a lot of play on the queen side. Shirov played the queen back to c7, and now a nice move from Kramnik, bishop f4. What is that? Can you not just take that bishop? Well, you can, but then white wins with queen takes b7 and this rook in the corner is lost. Both players are following theory because after bishop f4, Shirov of course did not take on f4, he played queen c8. Black already has made three queen moves in the seven moves played. As I said, it's slightly dubious for black, but it's still playable. Knight h4 is the main move here and Kramnik actually chose this move in games played three and four years later in 1997 and 1998 against Boris Gelfand and Nigel Short asking a question of this bishop. But in 1994 against Shirov he played e3 instead. Just preparing to develop that bishop. Knight f6, black is behind in development but the position is quite closed with this pawn formation. So it's not so easy for white to do something with that straight away. Here h3 is a move. If knight h5 comes, the bishop can go back to h2. Also bishop e2 is a move, just developing. But Kramnik goes for queen a4, making room for the b-pawn as we'll see. Knight bd7 developing, there comes that b-pawn, a6 h3 now, bishop e7, queen b3, making room for the a-pawn. White is going all in on the queen side. Shirov castles, bishop e2 developing, and bishop e4 with the idea to take on f3. That's quite an interesting idea. Kramnik castled, and Shirov indeed took on f3. Bishop takes, and black is now saying that in this type of closed position, the bishop pair is not very powerful. Shirov played his bishop to d8, bringing it to a better square on c7. a4 as planned, bishop c7 as planned, and Kramnik is not swapping those bishops, he plays bishop g5. The bishop was kicked straight away, and Kramnik also parts with his bishop pair, takes on f6, knight takes f6, and now we have opposite colored bishops. White still has his king's bishop, and so does black. They are on different colors, and black's bishop is having more scope than white's. The white bishop is just looking at that pawn. Black's bishop has an open diagonal. Kramnik played b5, consistent with his earlier moves. And e5, a classic example of the rule of thumb that an action on the wing has to be countered by an action in the center. And Kramnik closes the position with b6 and really cramps black's pieces. 
Bishop b8 and a5. You can ask the question, how will the rook on a8 ever get into the game? At this moment, it's hard to foresee that this rook will be the hero of the game. Shirov took on d4. E takes and bishop f4. Queen c2 from Kramnik, pre preventing black to play the queen to f5, which would be a nice square for the queen, and also keeping the bishop out of d2. As we'll see, white will want to send the black bishop back with g3. Queen d7 from Shirov, and there comes g3, and queen takes h3. Did black sacrifice a piece, or did white sacrifice a pawn? What's happening here? Well, you cannot take that piece straight away, because then the bishop on f3 is hanging, and black has won a pawn, and this white king is so open that black has a winning position here. Kramnik, of course, had seen it. He he did not just give up that pawn on h3, he played bishop g2 as an in-between move, hitting the queen. Queen went to h5, and now Kramnik took the piece, so black has indeed sacrificed the piece here. And it won't be the last sacrifice we'll see. Knight g4 from Shirov, logical move, threatening checkmate in one move with queen h2. So rook fd1 from Kramnik, making a flight square for the king. If you now play queen h2 check, then king f1 and queen takes f4, winning a second pawn for the bishop. The engine likes that idea, but in this position, Shirov did not play queen h2 check. He brought the rook to the center, bringing another piece into the attack. Rook d3, a strong defensive move, preventing rook e3 which would be a strong move for black. Why is that a good move? Is that rook not just hanging on e3? Well, let's show a variation. Let's just make a very silly move for white. Instead of rook e d3, let's play rook a b1. Then rook e3, bringing that rook into the attack, preparing for the other rook to come into the attack as well. And you cannot take on e3 because queen is 2 check, king f1, knight e3 check, forks almost all of white's pieces. Black will win the queen. So Kramnik played rook d3. Shirov gave a check. King f1 and f5 to enable a rook lift. Rook f6 to g6 is on the agenda, bringing that rook into the attack as well. Shirov is playing with all his pieces. All his pieces will be at the party. The engine is skeptical about black's play, but in a practical game, this looks very dangerous for white. Queen d2, protecting the f4 pawn, and rook f6 as planned. Black's pressure becomes very dangerous. One of the many threats is a nice checkmate. Let's again make silly moves for white to show you that checkmate combination. Let's play rook b1 again, then rook g6, and another silly move, rook a1, then we see the checkmate, queen h1. Is a very beautiful queen sacrifice you have to take and then knight h2 is checkmate the rooks take d squares away nice checkmate after rook f6 can white not win black's queen with rook h3 the queen cannot take on f4 now that pawn is protected by the queen well then black has rook g6 what a move that is and Shirov, of course, had to calculate all this over the board. If you now take the queen, then there is knight h2 check, king g1, and knight f3 check with that same fork on king and queen as we already saw. And the bishop cannot take the knight because it's pinned. Black wins here. King h1 and the queen is lost. The smoke has cleared and black has a winning material advantage. So back to the game, rook f6 with the threat of rook g6. Kramnik found a solution, he played f3. Attack in the knight, and how can black keep the attack going? Well, here's that move, the rook rules move. Rook e8 to e4. What is this? What a move. The rook can be taken in two different ways, the knight is also hanging. This move must have come as a shock to Kramnik. It's also move 31 with the time control being at move 40. I don't have the clock times, but I'm sure Kramnik was getting low on time here as well. 
And then you do not want to see a move like Rook E4 landing on the board. Incredible. Kromnik did not take on E4. What would have happened if he had done that? Then F takes E4, counter-attacking White's Rook. And in, in this insane position, White has to give the Rook back with the move Knight E2, according to the engine. Let's look at one other variation. What about Rook H3 to save the Rook attacking Black's Queen? Well, now we see the point. The F file is now open for the Rook on F6. So Rook takes F4 is check. And Black wins, for example, King E1. Then there's a mate in 2 with Queen G1 check. And if you interpose the bishop, this is checkmate. And if you play King E2, then this is checkmate. That's how quickly things suddenly can go after the opening of the F file through the Rook sacrifice. Let's go back. Rook E4, what a move. What if we take on E4 with the Knight instead of the Pawn? Knight takes E4. Then Black also recaptures, opening the F file. And if we save our Rook, there is Rook takes F4. And this is a very strange position. White is a rook up, but cannot do anything on the queen side, which is fully blocked, and cannot resolve the situation on the king side either, where black's pieces rule. The computer gives 0, 0, 0 in this position. Quite amazing. What if after rook e4 we take the knight instead of the rook? So f takes g4. Well, then there is rook takes f4 check. The other rook takes on f4. And black is two pieces down, but has a winning position. The white king is just too exposed for white to survive this. So what to do after rook e4? Kromnik saw that taking the rook is not good, that taking the knight is not good, and he found, to his credit, the best move in this position. Knight takes d5. White is going for counterplay on the queen side. What a move. The best move in the position. Kromnik found it. Shirov took the knight. And taking on e4 here is still not good for white. The point is c6. That was the point of the knight sacrifice. White is going to threaten to promote one of his pawns. If you take, then there is b7. And black has to play one of his rooks back to the back rank. To prevent white from queening, which gives white a winning advantage. The black pieces are distracted from the attack. So after c6, Shirov did not take on c6, he played rook takes f4, continuing his own attack. c takes b7, one square away from the promotion square, and rook e4, the rook back to that square. Unbelievably, black has calmly removed the f4 pawn in the last two moves, and now black's queen is covering the b8 square. The pawn on f4 has disappeared. Rook e4 takes f4, back to e4 while Kramnik is making great progress on the queen side. Incredible play from Shirov. Kramnik cannot promote, the b8 square is covered, so he played rook c1, and the threat is now rook c8 check, followed by promotion, and Shirov plays king h7, so that rook c8 is not with a check. If you play rook c8 anyway, threatening to promote, then Black will be able to make a draw through a perpetual check. Let's have a look. Queen g3 is then the move. Because if white now promotes as planned, then there is knight h2 check. King g1 only move. Rook e1 check. You have to take. And we get a perpetual. This game will be a draw. So in this position, Kramnik did not play rook c8. He promoted straight away, distracting the queen from the attack for a moment. Black has to take on b8, and now Kramnik took the knight, f takes g4. And if you take back on g4 with check, the rook gives check to the king, then king g1, covering the h2 square, and black's fire has been extinguished. The attack is no longer there, and white is winning with his extra piece. So after f takes g4, Shirov did not recapture, he hurried back with his queen back to h2 to keep the attack going. Rook f3 from Kramnik, and rook takes g4. Here, rook f2 is the best move, but it's not easy to find these moves. For move 39, Kramnik must have been in terrible time trouble. He played b7 instead, and after rook f g6, he finally cracked under the pressure. On the last move before the time control. 
Rook f2 does not work now after rook takes g2. Rook takes queen h1 check. King e2, rook takes g2 check. Black is winning. What you have to play after rook fg6 is promotion. Again, distracting black's queen. Queen takes b8, then rook f2 is possible. And if the queen comes back to h2, there is bishop takes d5. And this is a very complex position, but white should survive here, says the engine. Kramnik did not find b8 promotion to a queen. He played rook c2, and that is not a good move. Because now, Shirov took on g2. Queen takes, rook takes, rook takes, and queen h1 check. He's going to stop the b-pawn. If you interpose the rook, then this rook falls with check. And the move played in the game was king f2 to get out of the check, but then queen b1 covering the b7 pawn and the b8 square. And in this position, Kramnik resigned. Black will win the b pawn, white will probably win the f pawn, but black will be winning with his connected pass pawns on the king side, who will slowly but surely advance. When I was preparing for this video, I found a nice quote from the Uzbek Grandmaster Gregory Serper. He said, Shirov in his comments admits that white had many opportunities to play better and even get a big advantage. For some chess purists, it is a big turnoff, since for them, a true gem must be flawless. Nevertheless, I subscribe to the opinion of Mikhail Tal, who once said that he doesn't care if his attack gets refuted after some precise moves, which were found weeks or even months after the game. The only thing that really matters is if his opponents can find the best moves during the game. And in my view, truer words were never spoken. It's because of games like this that we love chess so much and that it's objectively not all completely correct doesn't really matter. At least not for me. I wonder what you think of this. You can let me know in the comment section. And after all these fireworks, let's look at our game. Rick, myself with white against a chess to impress viewers with black. I have just played on the 25th move the bishop from e3 to f4, putting pressure on your d6 pawn. And it is your move. You can take part in this game by putting black's 25th move in the comment section underneath this video. What would you play here? By doing so, you will be part of this very interesting game. You also will be in the raffle. At the end of the game, I will raffle a chess book amongst the viewers who have taken part in this game. So I'm looking forward to seeing your move for black in the comment section. And I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the Chess to Impress channel and please leave a comment. If you liked the video, it would be great if you could share it on social media by clicking the share button on YouTube. As I said, the link to the playlist of this piece rule series is in the description box of this video. You can find me on Instagram, on Twitter and on Facebook. This is Rick for Chess to Impress. Thank you for watching.